Thank you guys so much. That was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the joint English service of Union Church of Los Angeles. My name is Robin Stafford, hosting today's service. The Bible is the word of the living God. It is our guide and it instructs us into all wisdom and truth. We derive great wisdom from the scriptures and comfort in times of difficulty. Whether times are good or bad, there's always a reason to give God praise. If you're struggling today to find a reason to be joyful or if you need encouragement, it is so good that you're here with us and may you find hope and strength during this time of unusual circumstances and this season of difficulty. Psalm 717 says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord most high. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O most high. So let's do just that. We will begin our time together with gratitude. So, for what are you grateful for? Pause for a moment. Bring to mind a circumstance or a person, something that brings to your mind a sense of gratitude. It's good for us to be here. I pray you're all blessed for the time that we share in worship and fellowship. And so now before we go any further, I want to remind you of two things. One is today we celebrate the Lord's table in communion. You'll need to prepare your own communion items. So if you need to do so, please do so right now. Whatever you have available to use as the bread and the cup, of the Lord to get it now and set it aside near you for our communion time. Secondly is after our service, we will go into a social time of conversation and fellowship. You may want to get something to drink and snack on. That's totally fine. It's, it's a wonderful time to hear from everyone and just kind of stay connected. We're here together as the faithful community of God, even though we are physically separated during this pandemic. God, 
you are our God, and we earnestly seek you today. Seeking you among your people, teach us, help us, enlighten us by your spirit, that we may worship you. Amen. And amen. Okay, let's continue in our worship. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. <clears throat> I feel so grateful that having this Union Church community and worship God together with all of you. Uh, in this COVID-19 season, we are asked to pay extra attention to protect and keep our physical health. And I really hope we also pay extra attention to keep our spiritual health so that from non-visible enemy of virus and then also, you know, like not, not godly thinking, we can protect our physical and also health. Yeah. So let's praise together. The song we'll be singing is How Great Thou Art. <laughs> O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the words the hands have made, I see the star, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power to love. The universe is pain. Then sings, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Let's go to the next verse. And when I think that God his son has bearing, sent him to die, I scars can take it in. Dead on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Let's sing, then sing. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art When Christ shall come With shouts of acclamation and take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And they'll proclaim My God, how great Thou art Let's sing Then sings my soul my Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul How great thou to thee How great thou art How great thou art How great thou 
I'd like to do the um, morning prayer. Let us all bow. Heavenly Father, thank you. Uh, we come together as LA Union family to honor you, invite you, worship you, and proclaim how great thou art. You are great, Lord, and you are a God of justice. You are a God of peace. You're a God that gives us hope each and every day. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, that we may have a personal relationship with you, Almighty God. So Lord, we just ask for your blessing on our service this morning through Zoom. We thank you, Lord, for the virtual way that we can do this service together, to have fellowship, to worship, and just commune with you. We thank you, Lord. We pray and ask for your blessing and anointing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We are going to sing um, No Longer Sleep. chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through. My fears were drowned in breathless blood. Please join me in our community prayer. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. 
Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O oh God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. Graduating from Talbert School of Theology, Yoshihiro Horita, Masters of Art, New Testament. Graduating from UC Berkeley, Sheldon Chen with a bachelor in electrical engineering and computer sciences. He is the son of Mrs. Sanae Saito. Graduating from University of Southern California, Tyler Kota, bachelor in School of Cinematic Arts, Media Studies, son of Kevin and Mayumi Kota. Mela Motani, is a graduate from high school. She is the granddaughter of Mrs. Hisayo Watanabe. Matthew Nakama, graduating from Arizona State University, Bachelor of Arts in Sports Management. He is the brother of Caitlin and Nicole Nakama. Alyssa Ono, graduating from the University of Washington, Bachelor in Political Science. She is the daughter of Mrs. Tomoko Ono. Ng Ho Song, graduating from Fuller Theological Seminary with a Master's of Divinity. Turn your attention and focus on uh, blessing all the names that you saw there. Some of the names that you, I'm sure you recognize, others that you may not recognize. Uh, but let's just bless them as they've achieved and reached the significant mile marker in their lives. Our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much uh, for every name, for every individual listed on that screen, and for those that others that maybe we missed or we didn't know about. And so, Lord, would you shower them with your blessing, help them to know your pleasure, and we pray that as you're preparing them for this next season of their lives, um, they would have a strong sense of your leading, a strong, a strong sense of your shaping, um, of who you're molding and shaping them to be. In your name we pray. Amen. So, um, actually, it's funny because uh, I, I wasn't uh, thinking about graduation, but it really fits in some ways because, you know, I graduated at least from my undergraduate, I graduated with a liberal arts uh, degree. And one of the good things about a liberal arts degree is that it, you know, it's a general education. It teaches you a lot of different things. But school, especially college in general, is really about preparing you for that next stage. And especially as you go on, it becomes narrower and narrower and more specific. And it's much more about doing than being. Seminary is that way too. Seminary often it gives you skills or teaches you skills or strengths. Iho e e could probably attest to that. But often, at least historically, and I think seminaries are changing more and more now, they're trying to shape the student. And I think that's absolutely critical. And as we begin um, this message, a very familiar passage of scripture, uh, on the the Good Samaritan, we're going to start with a video. And uh, and this is going to feel a little abrupt, maybe just because it's um it's not a good good story that we start with. 
but I think it'll get at different elements of today's passage. This is a video clip, a news report of, um, about a man named, uh, really a hero, named Hugo Alfredo. And uh, just in case, you know, lest you think that's the world, certainly that couldn't be Christ followers. I wanted to highlight um, another study, or this isn't, this isn't another, it's another, another story that I want to share with you. This uh, was a study conducted in the early uh, 70s. And these two uh, psychologists, sociologists, decided to do a study at Princeton University, or Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, in the late fall, they got together a bunch of seminary students, and they had them meet in a building. And the researcher said, asked them to fill out a survey, and the surveys addressed whether students' religious views were intrinsic from within them or extrinsic in, in terms of the situation. And then what they did is they, uh, they said, you need to move now from this building to another building um, after you prepare a short message, a very short, like five to 10 minute message on the Good Samaritan and the story of the Good Samaritan. So they gave them a little time to prepare a, a short message. And then they said uh, to these groups of students uh, and they divided them into three groups. The first group they said, um, you have plenty of time, you're going to be early, you don't need to rush, just walk on over to this building and that's where part two of uh, today's class is going to be. The second group um, said, hey, you're going to be right on time, no need to rush, just take your time, get there, and then they'll start right away. And then the third group said, oh, we're running late, so try to hurry and get there because we're already behind schedule. And, uh, and what happened was, so, so the results of the study, which uh, are very int interesting, is uh, that first group, 63% of the participants in the early, you know, the ones who knew they were going to be early, there was lots of time, they stopped to help the stranger. I mean, 63%, that's not that great, right? The next group. Uh, who thought they were going to be right on time, 45% of them stopped. The last group who thought they were going to be late or were already running late, only 10% of the group stopped. Right? These are Princeton students studying to be ministers of the Word of God, pastors over churches, chaplains over various institutions, People who are dedicating their lives, feeling a call by the Lord. Uh, a combined less than 60% of all participants stopped to help. The other thing that I find interesting about the study was it was in a narrow alleyway that this person, what they did is they set up a man and they had him lying on the ground. I may have forgotten to say that part, so sorry. But they had a man lying on the ground and it was, in an, it was in a narrow alleyway that they were lying so that it was like, they, they said in the study, it was only four feet wide. And so you had to literally step over this person on the ground to get to your next class. To me, that's, that's remarkable, but I don't want to judge because I, I, I'm fearful that if I hadn't known about that, if I was much younger, maybe in that situation, I would have been one of the ones rushing, trying to get there, trying to impress my professor, not wanting to be late. And I wouldn't have stopped. In all likelihood, I wouldn't have stopped. It makes oh, What is that? I'm sorry, my uh, headphone just disconnected, but hopefully, can you guys still hear me? Oh. Yes. We can hear you. Do what you need to do, bro. We're with you. Reflect on how we would how we would react. It's an interesting thing, you know. Last week, Reverend Felix said, 
when we discover our why, our what makes sense. And I think he was pointing to the critical connection between being, right, our why, why we exist, our being, and our doing, or our what in us all. It's a dynamic relationship, this being and doing. And this is really at the heart of this parable. Uh, Michael last week shared a uh, video online on Facebook. And really, Michael's great because the sermon keeps living when you uh, follow Michael on social media. And one of the things that he posted that I just loved was uh, a little clip from a comedian named Michael Jr. No, that's not Michael Stafford's son, all right? And, uh, and I thought I would share Amen. That. <laughs> I thought I would share that just because it was uh, it's such a it's a, such a great video and it really gets the heart of this parable, but also what Pastor Felix was saying last week about our why and our what. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase "How do I know," they always want to put the "what" behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is is it's me. I travel around the country, and I do stand-up comedy, in case you know. <laughs> and in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's... You know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in Winston-Salem. I'm gonna show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if. Uh, your uncle just got out of jail. You got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound Okay, um, here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful 
because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Amen. So to me, it's a powerful thing, right? Video and experience like that get, that get captured on video are so powerful because basically he's, he took Pastor Felix's message and my message today and combined them into a three minute video. <laughs> And, and it's just astounding, right? It's awesome when we understand our why, right? Then we know our what. It's a powerful thing. And that's really at the core of what this parable is about. The parable of the Good, Good Samaritan is much more than just a story of compassion, a story of someone stopping to help others, not walking over somebody in distress. It's really about knowing the why, the who we are, and what is our neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Uh, just so you know what's before you right now, I have an image of, uh, it's a woodblock print by an artist named Sadao Watanabe. Uh, and it's a, he's done hundreds of woodblock prints of different scenes in scripture. He's a Japanese artist, no longer alive. Um, but I'm always captured by uh, this one, uh, among some others, that depict uh, different stories. And this one clearly depicts uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. Brother Kevin, if you would uh, read for us, and I'll uh, stop sharing my video. And I think we have the text for you as well that we're going to put on screen. All right, this morning's scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the, to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Amen. Thanks, Kevin. So I know all of you are familiar with this passage. Even those of you who haven't been Christ followers, those of you who are, you know, haven't been churchgoers, you've heard this story, you know of the story. It's, it's so common even in our society. How many hospitals are named Good Samaritan? How many laws are named the Good Samaritan Law? Right? This is a story that's familiar, that's woven into the fabric of American society. And there's probably no other parable in scripture that's better known or better understood than this Good Samaritan story, at least at a certain level understood. 
And so I'm not going to go over some of those other um, sermons or illustrations or points that you've probably heard before. Really, we're going to focus on just one thing this morning. And it's the reason Jesus gave the story, right? Jesus responded to this lawyer, this Pharisee, this teacher of the law. And he responded to the question, who is my neighbor? And it wasn't just an innocent question. It was a question trying to define, trying to justify his own life of not treating everyone with love or compassion or like their neighbor. So a couple of the reflections that I had, you know, with that question, with that focus in mind is number one, you know, when we hear the word neighbor, when I hear the word neighbor, I don't define it in the way that scripture defines it, certainly, nor the way Jesus defines it. And, and so let's start with just how you and I tend to define neighbor. Our neighbors are usually strangers. People, we don't, we don't know what's going on in their lives. I don't know. I've met my neighbors on each side of our townhouse. I don't know them intimately. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I may know, I may know what they do for work. But right, when we hear the word neighbor, even compared to 50 years ago, we do not have the same definition. You know, neighbors before borrowed sugar from each other, loaned each other things from their kitchen, made each other things from their kitchen. They were connected in some semblance of community. Most of us probably have not experienced that. We don't experience that with our neighbors. So therefore, when we hear the term neighbor, we don't think of somebody that we're connected to outside of someone that we may just wave hello to once in a while. So let's start there, our definition of neighbor, and we need to address that in our own hearts in terms of what that means. Number two, neighbor in scripture, in the Old Testament, almost was always used to describe fellow Israelites. And I think we can all probably understand that a little bit because we have groups that we we find affinity with. Maybe you're an athlete, so when you meet another athlete, you feel a little affinity to them. Maybe it's based on your ethnicity, which is absolutely normal, right? When I'm in a crowded room and I see somebody that looks like me, remarkably handsome, right? I go over to them. No, of course, if I, if I see another Asian, there is something that I feel like I'm drawn to. I, I, I used to go to a black church. I remember sitting down with my pastor at that time and we were having lunch and um, another black man walked in. And when he walked in, I noticed that my, uh, when he walked by our table, I noticed that my pastor, he like gave him a nod. And I said, oh, do you know him? And he's like, oh no, that's just a black man's nod. Like when you see another African-American, you nod, you acknowledge them, right? So there's this thing about people we find affinity to that we find connectedness to. And that's really what the Old Testament did. Most people in the, during Old Testament times, when they heard the word neighbor, they thought of a fellow Israelite. In the New Testament, in first, first century Holy Land, during the time of Jesus, that term even became more narrow. The Pharisees defined neighbor as someone who was a part of their community and only their community. Everyone outside of that community dwelled in darkness and was to be shunned in order to avoid spiritual contamination. Right? They believed that all non-observant Jews transmitted that contamination. So if you were in first century Jerusalem, first century Holy Land, anyone who wasn't a part of those who are Orthodox or honoring the law, you didn't have any relationship with because they were not your neighbor. So the first thing this passage does is it, it, com it confronts our standard definitions of what it means to be a neighbor. The second thing I observed and, and as I studied this was in Jewish tradition, there is a thing called the rule of three. Lots of stories are told with a priest, a Levite, and then the third member of that story was always 
an Israelite. And so when, when Jesus began telling the story, everybody in his audience would have understood that the third person that would appear on that road would have been an Israelite. But lo and behold, Jesus flips the story, flips the tradition, and he says, no, a Samaritan appeared. And not only did a Samaritan appear, that Samaritan acted unlike the priest and the Levite, those who represented the purity of Judaism, right, of what it meant to be an Israelite. And who were the Samaritans? The Samaritans were, uh, can be found, uh, evidence can be found of their civilization back to 722 BC. And their animosity, the animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans goes as far back as that. It's, it's much too complex, like many centuries old conflicts, the, the, the reasons for why that conflict exists, the reasons for why that hatred exists between these communities is too complex to go into. We would have to spend really half a year studying this to really understand but know that there was a mutually held disdain that existed between Samaritans and Jews. First, centuries, Jew, first century Jews harbored so much disdain that they would publicly curse Samaritans in the synagogue. Even the apostles James and John in scripture, we know they were, they were, they were nicknamed the sons of thunder. In Luke 9, they wanted to call down fire to destroy a Samaritan village. And Jesus rebuked them for that. That's the kind of animus that existed between Jews and Samaritans. And lo and, before, lo and behold, when the Samaritan comes down the road, who stops? It's the person that you would name last as a neighbor. That's who Jesus defines as neighbor. A neighbor is much more than the person who lives next door to us. A neighbor is much more than someone we have affinity to. I dare say a neighbor is much more than even those that we are connected to by blood. Jesus redefines what it means to be a neighbor by those who are most different from us. Those who are most unlike us because we're connected by something greater, right? And we've studied this before. We all bear the sacred image of God, his sacred image. And so therefore, they're our neighbor. More than, again, we need to redefine neighbor. I want to say they're more than our neighbor, but neighbor in this context, neighbor as Jesus defines it, is someone that we cannot be separated from. Someone that we hold more in common with because we bear Christ, God's sacred image. That's what it means to be, that's what it means to be a neighbor. I was thinking of different ways of closing this message, and I knew, you know, I knew it wouldn't be able to, I, we wouldn't be able to spend a lot of time on it. And uh, I found these words from Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. He spoke these words at a sermon that he gave on the day before he died, the day before he was assassinated. This sermon or this, this excerpt of a sermon that I'm gonna read is from his sermon that he gave at the Bishop Charles Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee. He was there encouraging the protests that were beginning, advocating for the poor, advocating for systemic justice. And he used this parable in part of that message. So listen to his words and listen to the spirit of the Lord. One day a man came to Jesus and he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters of life. At points he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and throw him off base. The man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
Now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical, uh, philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. And he talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. You remember that Levite and a priest passed by the other side? They didn't stop to help him. But finally, a man of another race came by. He got down from his beast, decided to be compassion, not to be compassionate, but be a proxy. He got down with them, administered first aid, and helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying, this was the good man. This was the great man, because he had the capacity to project the I into the thou. I'm going to say that again just because I think it's so powerful. Jesus ended up saying that this was the good man. This was the great man because he had the capacity to project the I into the thou and to be concerned about his brother. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. At times, we say they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering, and they had to get down to Jerusalem so they wouldn't be late for their meeting. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who had engaged in a religious ceremony in religious ceremonies uh, was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. But I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. I remember Mrs. King and I, were for, when we were first in Jerusalem, we rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as the setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conductive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 20 hundred mi uh, 1,200 miles, or rather 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 22, 22 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the Bloody Pass. And you know it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over at that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking and he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, lure them there for quick an easy seizure. And so the first question that the priest asked and the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and he rever reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Not, if I stop to help the Samaritan workers, uh, sanitation workers, what will happen to my job? Not, if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not, if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation.
I'm sorry for uh, that extended reading, but I just felt like it was so timely again, not timely just then, but timely for us now. The day after we celebrate the 4th of July, in a season of not just pandemic, but social unrest, where inequality, the reality of the inequalities that exist in our society have been heightened and made some of us who weren't aware more aware. So the question before us is, who is our neighbor? And what will we do about it? It's not enough just to know, right? It's not just enough just to define who our neighbor is. We have to act upon the truth and reality of who our neighbor is. That's the message of the Good Samaritan. That's the message that Jesus was using to address that question that that lawyer had, that Pharisee had. That's what he's trying to impress, impress into us this morning. Who is our neighbor? And how is that defined? How is that reality defined by how we behave? The why brings meaning to the what. But really, there is a complex relationship between the what and the why. It reinforces who we are. It reinforces the truth of who we are and who our sister and our brothers are as God created them and God created us. I'm going to invite you to get the elements as we transition to sharing communion. And feel free, you know, you don't, you don't have to use wine, you don't have to use grape juice, you don't have to use bread. You can use whatever is on hand. I think I've shared this before. I've done communion with rice, uh, and you can do it with water or tea or, or whatever you'd like. I'll just give you a little time just to reflect on the message on what I think God is impressing into our church, our church family, as you get your elements and as we prepare. And again, what a beautiful, I'll just say this before we begin, what a beautiful way to end this message as we think about what, what Jesus defines as our neighbor. And as we come together to break bread, to remember him, we do this in communion, not only with the Lord, but with each other and with other Christ followers, other bearers of his image around the world. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for which you, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord God, we thank you for your body broken for us. We thank you, Lord, for the torture you endured for our sake, for the punishment you endured to bear our sins. As we chew this bread, as we consume this bread, we remember your suffering. And we remember why, the why of why you suffered. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Lord God, we thank you for the blood that you spilt and shed on our behalf. That blood that washes us clean. Your blood that makes us pure as white as snow. We thank you that your blood really almost is like a pair of glasses that you put on so that once when you saw sin, you now through Christ's blood see us as clean, as pure, as holy. So as, as we've shared the bread and the cup today, we thank you, Lord, that we're bonded together by this mutual image that we share, this image, your image, the sacred image that we all bear, and the fact that we're tied together by the sacrifice on the cross, or your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for purifying us. Thank you for giving us a hope and a future. In your name we pray, amen.